What's the latest in terms of backlog of testing? So we see yesterday 102 new cases or whatever it was in the last few days, 52 today. What rough time period does that reflect of, of, of positivity, of positive tests? Is that going back two weeks, three weeks, or is that as recently as last weekend? Uh, in general, it will be a two to four week time frame, two to three weeks. We will certainly in coming days continue to see whether or not increased numbers from July 4th weekend are contributing to what we're seeing. We definitely have social gatherings in these specific locations that have been mentioned as a key concern. And that's why we want people to understand the importance of wearing masks when you're engaged in those activities on the beaches, on boats, in uh, homes and backyards, so people can make the change that we know will make a difference. So, Dr. Director, is it possible that we've seen it disappear here in Rhode Island to some extent? We're beginning a second wave. Is there any? official position on that right now. We are still very early on. As the governor said, we've seen a couple of days. It's enough for us to continue to ensure that people are following the rules regardless. Anytime you slip up, there's going to be an increase. So we need to address what's going on out there together, kindly, with consideration. Director, we've heard from people who it's taken a week, 10 days to get their test results. Can you speak to that? And is there a backlog on the testing? And it has the rapid testing under that was shifted away from the, sea, uh, the Twin River site. So what can you say about how long it's taking people to get the results who are either trying to get back to work or something of the like? We have been laser focused on the lab turnaround time for testing. I can share some of the data that we have for different labs for results received the week of July 5th to July 11th. These numbers are the average number of days from when a patient is swabbed to when a result is available in an electronic laboratory reporting system. For our uh, bioreference lab, it's almost three days that are reported. Uh, for Eastside Clinical Labs, it's almost five days. Lab core is almost six days. Uh, the, one of the, the hospitals within the lifespan system, it's uh, about uh, a day or so. Mayo Clinic, is uh, two and a half days. The Rhode Island State Health Laboratory is under two days as the uh, turnaround time. For the rapid test, we do still have instruments that are throughout the state that we had been provided um, for the federal, from the federal uh, government that are embedded in places where we can really target symptomatic uh, people in hospitals or related to congregate settings. Um, and we want to continue to think through how to leverage those for uh, understanding or adding to the uh, turnaround time issue that we have. Are you saying people who are seeing up to a week long wait, that's an anomaly? No, this is the average. So we have numbers of people who are seeing those longer uh, time frames, and that's why we're laser focused on it. Um, to continue to get us closer to a larger number falling within what we're seeing for the average. How accurate are these tests? All tests have their variability. Um, for the PCR tests that exist, we have consistently said they are most accurate when someone has symptoms. The sensitivity and specificity of those tests can then be in the 90s, 90% 90 or so for those tests. When you're using the PCR test on someone who does not have symptoms, then the accuracy may decrease, but there is still value that we find with it, particularly in identifying people who are positive, which gives us the ability to initiate the case investigation and the contact tracing and get them into isolation and their contacts quarantined. Governor, may I follow up with you on the small business? Yeah. Um, so, you know, you remember when you said the 10 million was coming from Goldman Sachs, that went pretty quickly that one day. So 50 million is going to go pretty quickly. 
can you talk specifically about, so is it, is it capped at a number, and does commerce review each application to say, this is an, again, it gets into picking winners and losers here. You talked about food, hospitality, retail. What about the hair salon? What about the marketing agency? Yeah. And I'm all that. So when it applies, but just before yeah. he gets there, yeah. you said here a week ago, we're going to get this out the door quickly, yeah. right away. Now you said the application may be available in a week or two. Yeah. And then you've got to go through all of that. So now we're looking way into August. And so what do you say to the small businesses who wish that you had done this a month or six weeks ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's what I say. I know you're struggling. As I said, we've already put $2 billion out the door plus the money we've put out. And you haven't done that. But my point is, my point is, the need is so huge. We want to get this out as fast as possible. We've talked to a handful of other states who've done it. They are all struggling to get it out efficiently, effectively. You say it'll go out the door like that. I hope it does, because in Utah, for instance, <laughs> for whatever reason, maybe it's the way they structured it, it isn't going out the door. So all of which is to say. You said it would go out the door quickly. And it will, and it will. But what, we, what I've learned is it's more important that we get it right that we get it to the right businesses, that we, we have accountability, and if that takes another week, then it takes another week. But listen, if we can get it out in two weeks, we'll get it out in two weeks. If it takes us three weeks, it takes us three weeks. I need to do it right, and as I look around at other states, they've, they've struggled. And so, as I've told the Commerce Secretary, you need to get this right. There needs to be accountability, easy access, not a lot of red tape, and get it out as fast as possible. If it's two weeks, it's two weeks. That's fabulous. If it needs three weeks, I think it's worth the extra week. So just again, before he gets to the specifics, you said 50 million in a first round. Yes. And then can you, again, you said another 20% 20, 20 of the 100 for the minority-owned businesses, or is that a straight 20 million on top of the 50 million? No, it's a, it's a piece of it. So there's, today I announced 50 plus the 26. And then on top of that, we have the 20 from the Small Business Development Fund. So today is 100 million straight away. I said it's a first round because I think you may be right. We may run through it quickly. I'm hopeful we find that we've done a good job, and then we'll replenish it. He's itching to answer. Well, he knows all the details. <laughs> uh. The program will be structured so that there are rules by which uh, decisions are automatically made in many instances. So there's categorization of businesses. Uh, for example, um, if an industry was especially a hard hit, a severely impacted industry, hospitality, uh, there will be uh, criteria that enable a business to reach the monetary benchmarks to get up to $15,000 per business. Um, and the uh, there will be an, uh, an ability to assess the revenue loss exp experienced by the particular business and by virtue of that formula, get the check out the door. Um, that's one example. Uh, there will be availability of funds for non-severely impacted industries, other industries where because of a, a fall off in customer base or other conditions, they experienced COVID impacts. The federal government in the funds to the states requires that we demonstrate COVID impacts in order for federal funds to flow. That's part of why the governor explains that there do need to be systems in place. There has to be some thin layer of documentation in order to enable the funds to flow. Uh, we also want to ensure that we're investing in businesses that are open for business or planning to open in the near future. We want to make sure that these are viable businesses so there'll be some questions asked and some tests required of businesses to ensure that we're making sound investments on the part of, of, uh, of the Rhode Island taxpayer and the American taxpayer. Um, there will be instances in which review is required at Commerce, but for the vast majority of cases, no, because that would take much too much time. There will be instances, though, where questions get asked uh, or a uh, a short plan needs to be produced by a business, and commerce does need to step in and review. So that's that's in response to uh, to those questions. Is it a maximum of fifteen thousand, regardless of what your need is? It is a maximum of fifteen thousand in this route. Okay. 
So you're talking about a ranking system. They have to meet this, 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 this. It's Are not a ranking system, meaning it's not priority within a ranking system. It is mainly first come, first serve if you meet the criteria. And it is a need, um, a need gradient, a need array that we look at to say you have this amount of revenue loss and you're in an industry that was crushed. You get a higher dollar amount. It, it is not a ranking system. But that's not an algorithm. Somebody at Commerce has to make that determination. No, it right? predominantly is an algorithm, actually. Okay. If you experience this, so for example, to get into it with you, uh, the minimum revenue loss required for any business to receive funding is 30%. Um, there's another threshold at 50% revenue loss, a very significant loss, where higher dollar amounts are allowed. You either are or you aren't at 30. You either are or you aren't at 50. You need to document your revenue loss over the requisite time period. The dollars flow. So there is an algorithm, in fact, that uh, for, the, uh, for the most part carries this out. As the governor explained, we ha only the minority of states have started up programs of this kind using CARES Act funding, but a handful have. We've had the ability to reach out to the heads of economic development and their teams in nearly all of these states and carefully review their systems, which ones make sense from a federal requirement perspective, which ones are efficiently administered so that we can get the dollars out and we put it together in part on that basis. We're also grateful for the input provided uh, by Lieutenant Governor McKee and his business coalition. They have helped to inform the process through their advocacy and their information. When do you think the first dollar is going to go out the door? Uh, likely, uh, dollars will be available about a month after an application is complete. And we expect applications to be available within a couple of weeks. And we say that because we have assessed the experience of other states and we want to make sure we're being very realistic. Just one more question for the governor on this. Um, you had said a week ago here, you had said those other governors in the four states that I listed are gambling because they're not sure with fill, backfilling the budget hole. Aren't you the one taking the gamble because Congress has not yet allowed the CARES Act money to be used to backfill your budget problem? Aren't you taking the gamble? So I would say this. Um, we are, I am governing through a lot of uncertainty, so you make judgment calls. I don't know exactly what Congress is going to do. I spent half hour on the phone with Senator Reid yesterday. He's working his tail off to get us more money. He think, he's reasonably optimistic it's going to come. One of the options on the table, though, is just allowing us more flexibility with what we've already had in order to use it for budget backfill. So um, it's, I won't, it's just uncertainty. So you do the best you can get, if given the uncertainty. Right now, as the $600 comes to an end at the end of July, as PPP is starting to run out for these small businesses, as it's kind of coming to a head with a lot of small businesses are saying, God, help us out, I just made the judgment call that it's time to do something. And um, I hope Congress does the right thing and sends us more. And then if they do, we can do even more of this. So I, I, that's how I see it. Thank you. Governor, can we, uh, just on the beat situation, so the, the problem, both Scarborough and Musquamacate are huge beaches. Mm -hmm. So the problem is on the beach, there's too many people, is that correct? On the beach, concession stands, in the pavilion, everything. So this weekend, it, it's supposed to be over 90 both days. Oh, yeah. So the, the family of four in Cranston, they pack up, they go down. In Scarborough, 75% of the lot is empty. Mm -hmm. So I have two choices. I either try to find another beach, mm -hmm. which now gets crowded in traffic, or I say I'm just going to take the ticket because I'm not going to turn around and go back to Cranston with my family already in the car. Mm -hmm. what, what, so I'm don't telling you now it's Wednesday to make a new plan. <laughs> so that's why I'm telling you on Wednesday that chances are you're not going to get a spot. Maybe you should go at 5 o'clock instead of 9 in the morning. Maybe you should go first thing in the morning and, and leave early. Maybe you should not go to the beach. If you take the risk of getting ticketed, you could be towed. Your ticket could be much bigger than you're expecting. Most likely you'll be met by someone who says, you're not allowed to park there. So that's why I'm telling you now, you probably want to think about an alternative plan and don't pack the family of four into the car and head to Scarborough thinking you're going to spend the day there. 
because it's going to be very reduced. Uh, you know, I can't tell, maybe you have a friend, you can walk to the beach, maybe you can go later on, maybe, you know, but it, this is why I'm saying it. And by the way, let me just say, it's, this is a tough call, because that, that was me as a kid. But you get piled into the back of the car and you drive to San Juan Cove Beach. Um, having said that, I gotta keep I gotta keep a lid on this because I also have kids who have to go to school and people who have to go back to work and people who I want to keep out of the hospital. But just the, the, the so the solution is not to spread people out more at the beach. It's to reduce the number yeah, attending exactly. those two exactly. beaches. But if you the Ramundo family got in the car, wouldn't you then make try to find maybe East Metunic we can get in? Yeah. Maybe we can Absolutely. But won't it then just put more demand on those other beaches? Uh, possibly. But, you know, hopefully, so let me say this, 70% of the people who go to Musquamica Beach are not from Rhode Island. So um, I hope they get the memo and don't come. Scarborough, you're just going to have to make other plans. It, it, it couldn't be just, it couldn't be Rhode Island residents get priority over other states, perhaps? We're going to try this for now. We're going to try this for now. We're trying everything that we know how to do. We're going to see how it goes. Here's what I know. Last weekend didn't go well. Last weekend was not good. Too many people on the beach, very few masks being worn, overcrowding into the restaurants and bars and such right around Musquamacate, very few masks being worn. So we want to cut down on the volume. Hopefully people are listening to this and saying, well, we're not going to the beach this weekend. Let's find something else to do. Even though it's going to be 90 and sunny, and I've been inside all spring, and I'm a taxpayer, and this is my one time to well, go to the beach. Well, then go at night. Go early in the morning. Don't stay as long. Go to another beach. Go to Lincoln Woods. I get it. I understand. Governor, I'd like your uh, proposal this morning, your, your rise together. And it's very interesting, and it's very forward-looking. And it's, in many ways, the long-term flip side of what you were talking about in terms of short-term assistance to businesses and small businesses. Mm -hmm. And the theme that I get out of it is that you want to position Rhode Island going forward um, in terms of competitive advantage relative to other places. In other words, you want Rhode Island to be a highly educated workforce, to have skills and uh, education to prepare workers for advanced manufacturing. Um, you talk about the Rhode Island Promise Program, the free tuition program at CCRI, which has been very successful. Um, but there are not a ton of details in that, which is understandable because you're projecting things 10 years or more out. Um, but how is Rhode Island going to be competitive in an economy where everybody else is trying to compete with us on exactly the same terms? So, yes, the world may be more amenable to, say, work from home, but what happens if the people working from home are located in India or China earning 10% of American labor rates? Or what happens if um, um, we try to compete on, uh, with and other states simply cut prices, which is how we lost a lot of manufacturing decades ago. So I would say this. Those challenges exist all the time, forever. Rhode Island's been competing with every other state and every other country, and America's been competing with every other country. So it's a matter of focusing on your competitive advantages, um, and so that's what we will have to do. For example, Rhode Island's one of very few states, I'm told, that never closed manufacturing. Same thing with building. I never said shut down all building and construction, shut down all manufacturing. So we, I am getting interest from manufacturers who've said, Rhode Island seems serious about manufacturing, and to which I say we're very serious about it. We have job training programs for it. We have excellent manufacturers here. We're open for business for manufacturing. So we're going to sell what's good about us. You know, it is much less expensive, and I would argue higher quality of life, to live in Providence or Rhode Island than in Boston or the suburbs. So if you hear this, if you are a software company or a tech company located anywhere on the East Coast, New York City or Boston, and you are growing, you ought to hire Rhode Islanders, let them work from home in Rhode Island, let them work remotely, and pop into the office in Boston or New York anytime, because we'll be less expensive, more loyal, and better trained. So 
offshore wind. There's one state in America that has a functioning offshore wind uh, farm, us. Let's lean into that. In any event, I think that um, you're right. It's a, comp it's a competitive game, but we got to get in the ring and compete. How do you fight significant changes to the entire economy? For example, what if jobs are increasingly automated? Does that put Rhode Island at a competitive No, I think that's some of this is national policy, and obviously we need a we we need a national strategy to help America compete. Um, I think Rhode Island's at an advantage in that respect. We teach computer science in every grade, in every public school. We do have two years tuition-free community college. We are investing significantly in tech training. Uh, so I think that I, I would lean into that. I think it's all about skills. Uh, we also, you know, I think the discussion now as it relates to equity, people want to live in, people want to work, businesses want to do business in places that have good values and a commitment to equity, and I, I would lean into that as I sell Rhode Island. I want to say one thing to your question, and then I'll get to everyone. Um, you asked about the lag time, and Dr. Alexander Scott gave you the breakdown. You said people need to get back to work, and I am hugely sympathetic to that. There's another thing that we need to keep our eye on. The name of the game for this is contact tracing. I get sick, I need to know right away if I'm positive, I gotta get a call right away, Gina, who have you been in touch with? Um, so if it takes five or six days before we know if I'm positive, and if I have been continuing to interact with people, that is a problem, and it makes our contact tracing less effective. So we are, as she says, laser focus, like, we have got to reduce that testing lag time, and we will. Every state's struggling with it, and we're working on it. Because not only do you have to wait at home and not go to work for six days, if you are not waiting at home and you continue to be with your friends and family, think of all those people that you can infect before we can do effective contact tracing. And then relatedly, which is something the doctor said, but she's, as usual, more tactful than I am, we need you to pick up the phone and participate in contact tracing if we call you. If 17% of people just won't interact with us, that's a problem. So if you get a call from the Department of Health, call us back and say who you've been in contact with. Because that, that's, does that make sense? So do you know what the problem is and why some of these labs are taking much it's longer than just labs? Because they're processing for other states too? Correct. It's now that big states Texas, New York, everyone is doing more testing and kind of like catching up to where we were. These big labs have a lot of demand and they're getting behind. And so I'm trying to pivot and figure out, okay, what do we do? We need to do more testing at the Department of Health. We need to do, we need to be more creative. So that's the honest answer. You mentioned the Small Business Development Fund. You're going to use some money from that to help local small businesses. But you were previously highly critical of that proposal. You said you wanted a line item veto for that particular issue. So why the change of heart? Yeah, no change of heart. I still don't like it. Uh, but Stefan has figured out a way to make it. Um, he's worked really hard to negotiate with the providers, the funding partners, and convince them to focus the program on businesses hit by COVID. So it's kind of making lemonade out of lemons. And I'm, I'm actually happy about this. If they're going to do the right thing and actually invest in Rhode Island small businesses who've been hurt by COVID, then you're taking an otherwise not good program and turning it into a good thing. And a non-COVID question for you. Um, do you believe that ballots should be mailed to all Rhode Island registered voters for the September primary? Yes, so here's what I believe. I believe that we have to have a process of voting that everybody trusts and every knows that every vote will get counted. Um, the Secretary of State uh, and the Board of Elections, I have said to them, you guys need a plan in place to deal with this. 
and they're working on it. I know the Secretary of State has some concerns around the logistics of just being able to do vote by mail. And so I've asked her to, uh, you know, I'd like to see a plan from her that guarantees effective um, administration of vote by mail. So yes, I, su I support it if it can be executed in a way that everyone gets to vote and everyone's vote is counted and everyone has trust in it. So, and as I say, the Secretary of State is responsible for that. I know she's working on it and I know she's putting plans in place. It's a good concept, but it has to be well run. Me? Okay, thank you. Uh, Secretary Pryor, Pat Ford. Uh, some real specifics on this process for the distribution of funds. First of all, is this a grant or a loan? It is a grant. And we'll we know that small businesses are in some instances burdened with loan debt. So we want to ensure that a very substantial portion of our program was, was grant funding, and that's what the governor is debuting today. Will this represent taxable income? We don't know the answer to that from the federal government. Um, it's a very good question. There's ambiguity from the IRS in general pertaining to investments and incentives uh, offered to businesses, so we will likely need to seek a, an opinion letter from the IRS. Thank you. Um, let's get into the sort of, sort of the nitty gritties <clears throat> so people can start to prepare. Um, credit checks, uh, cross-reference with the federal dollars, uh, will you be in touch with the DOR, Rhode Island's DOR, mm -hmm. in terms of cross-referencing this? And critically, um, how heavily will your algorithm depend on, for lack of a better term, the potential morbidity of the business? Um, let me see if I can recall those uh, and uh, hit them. Please feel free to follow up. Uh, we will establish a viability test for businesses. For example, uh, we recognize that uh, PPP put businesses through the paces. So making it through that process uh, is a check in favor of a business on a viability test. Side note, um, there was a comment on the governor's reference to PPP and the fact that over $2 billion in PPP and idle financing was offered to Rhode Island businesses. Keep in mind, uh, that was through effort from the Raimondo administration under this governor. There was an enormous outreach effort, especially to minority and unbanked businesses, to ensure that they got into the program, including the establishment of the Goldman program, but not limited to it. Just want to give the governor credit on that. Um, so PPP would be a viability test feature. You've passed that test, secured it, you're working towards forgiveness. Uh, yes, we will consult uh, tax lien information and other information pertaining to a business's performance in that respect as a viability measure. So there's a series of checks that will occur. Um, you also asked credit check. Personal credit check. Uh, about personal credit check. Likely no. Uh, that would be time consuming and probably wouldn't teach us all that much. Uh, so we're trying to find the balance among criteria that are quickly available so they won't delay the process, but also provide insight for a business. There are instances in which uh, the viability tests may not be super majority in favor of a small business. Again, we want to move rapidly, but we want to ensure that we are being fair to all those businesses out there that have paid their bills, paid their taxes, are remaining viable, and uh, merit the government's investment. So there are instances in which we may require a uh, new normal plan, meaning how is the business adapting to ensure that it is capable of uh, performing, of, of existing, and in fact thriving. There'll be a template-based uh, mini plan that some businesses have to fill out if they are not doing as well on their viability tests. And in those instances, as explained in the context of a previous question, there will be some review required. But we're trying to make sure as much of it is mechanized as possible. I guess just as a final summary, on one level, doing your best to disseminate this money as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. On the second level, do you fear that this burden of paperwork, uh, which is responsible, will ultimately prevent a lot of the, I'll call it the, the uh, micro businesses from actually applying? We believe we're striking the right balance. Uh, I've explained to you those tests and sources of information that we're including and excluding. Sometimes we're excluding because it would just be too time consuming and it would be inaccessible to the smallest of businesses. Um, so 
we are, we are striking the right balance, we believe. We're working very hard to assess from the experience of other states. And quite frankly, the governor has established an advisory council for the purpose of business restoration. We've consulted chambers of commerce in Rhode Island, the industry associations of Rhode Island. Big thank you to them. And again, to the lieutenant governor and his team. So we've done all of that. Um, the, the, uh, the other thing that I want to point out is there will be a, a heavy degree of electronic filing that will enable things to move faster. And very, very importantly, we're not going to uh, leave it to chance as to whether we reach businesses in the small business community of Rhode Island. We're going to do outreach. So the governor explained how there's funds for technical assistance and outreach uh, in the additional $26 million uh, on top of the $50 million for the direct grants. We will be working with organizations like the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the Rhode Island Black Business Association, the United Way, others in a coalition that will enable us to reach previously unconnected businesses, often unbanked businesses, the businesses that would be harder to uh, get uh, involved in such a program. We're going to work very hard at this, but it will take work, and in some instances it will take a bit of time. Mr. Pryor, uh, will this be public when you mention uh, who receives the grants? Uh, some information will be public and some is proprietary and will not. So, and we can answer that more thoroughly, but we've already given thought to that. Uh, and there's precedent from other grant and finance programs that the state has administered. When you mention working with black businesses, mm -hmm. are you open to the concept that Mayor Lors announced, which is reparations? I just have to hear more about the plan. I'm not familiar precisely with his plan. So I'd be happy to look into it and find out. So you are open to that? I just, I honestly don't know what the mayor has announced. My question is for Dr. Alexander Scott. Going back to contract tracing, we've been doing it for some time. I'm wondering what it has revealed in terms of hotspots. We know the community hotspots, but has it helped you identify hotspots in restaurants or retail spaces, that specifically? Absolutely. That's the focus of contact tracing. What we have seen thus far is hotspots connected to social gatherings on beaches and boats. So making it clear that the outdoors doesn't necessarily negate the risk that occurs. We're really focused on making sure that people are wearing masks in those areas outdoors um, and are distancing where they can in those social gathering settings. Those are scattered. We are seeing them as well. Uh, the prominence of the clusters of cases are more with the social gatherings in the settings I mentioned. And are you in, uh, thinking of increasing enforcement of different things other than at beaches? Like, for example, Federal Hill people are gathered on the weekends in large groups without masks. Is there going to be enforcement in places other than the two beaches? We are looking to get to all of the hot spots where people are gathering not wearing masks applying the notion of kindness and consideration, but making sure people are informed, have masks, have hand sanitizer, and stop risking more cases occurring in Rhode Island. Thank you.